first of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, we are going to be talking about student organization basics today. My name is Amanda Perez. I am an assistant director in the Office of Student Activities. I work primarily with our student organizations and then fraternity and sorority life. Um, I'm super excited for today. So the very first thing, again, this is a chat feature, as well as what do you want to get out of uh, for today? What initial questions do you have before we get started? Um, as you're typing your responses in there, uh, what I'm looking for is I want to make sure that whenever you leave this meeting, you don't roll your eyes and be like, mm, she had great music to begin with, but I didn't really learn anything. So I'm going to give you all about a minute to type in questions. And if I don't see any, then we'll just kind of move on. Um, but I really wanted to start this presentation today, kind of seeing why you were here and what you were hoping to get out of it. Thank you. So one question is um, to be able to learn what UTSA has to offer, um, I assume specifically for student organizations. And then getting more involved. Okay, cool. Um, so, so is it Savannah and I apologize or Savina? Um, Savannah, okay. What, um, are you already in an organization right now? Or if actually all of our attendees want to pop in what organizations they're a part of so I can kind of see um, what audience I'm talking with today. Patrick, thank you. So updates to running organizations during this new time. Learn anything, I appreciate that. That is no problem, Savannah, at all. Okay, cool, we have ACM in the house, Student Psychology Association, Rowdy Creators. Delta Alpha Pi. Okay, so let's see. And the student chapter of the Wildlife Society. So we will be covering hopefully a little bit of what you're looking for, which is the what the university has to offer, ways to get involved. Um, I'll probably then edit this PowerPoint a little bit as we go through to help answer some of these questions. Um, and then I will share some updates at the end, um, but I will let you know. I, I don't think right now, even as staff members, we really know what the plans are moving forward, but we can definitely have a chat about what this could look like. So I'll keep the chat up. Please pop in your questions as we go through. So the best thing um, to really familiarize yourself with right now is Rowdy Link. Whether you're looking to get involved or you already have um, an organization on campus you're involved with, uh, from the organization's perspective, this is where you're gonna manage everything that you do. Who's a part of your organization? What events are you having on campus? Um, putting news articles out about yourself, having a gallery. Uh, this year, which we'll be releasing some documents here in the next few weeks, is Campus Labs, which is our um, host of Rowdy Link. Uh, they are now allowing videos to be embedded in Rowdy Link. So you can now create promotional videos or recruitment videos or intro videos that you can kind of embed into your Rowdy Link. So not only is it your management tool to make sure your organization is up and running, but it's also a way to let other students know who you are and what you're about. So for anybody in here who's looking to get involved, um, always start with Rowdy Link first. You can filter out through organization type. So that way you can really look at what organizations we have on campus that are interested in um, or that are doing things that you're interested in. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the registered student organization cycle. So kind of what exactly we consider your RSO year, what you're required to do, maintaining your active organization management, um, and then your student organization resources that the institution offers for you. So part one is the uh, RSO cycle. So the very first thing that you do, whether you're a new organization or you're a current organization, um, is either attend a new student organization orientation, or you would start at number five with Rowdy Link. But once you've kind of figured out where you are, 
you'll go and you'll actually register through RowdyLink. And then you'll complete your state mandated risk management training annually. You'll submit your financial statement report and then you end the year completing Rowdy Sync. And then you start that over. So this is kind of the circle that you'll live in every single year as a student organization. And as you have questions about any of the slides, pop them into the chat um, and I can go back and we can pause. Um, but this is kind of like what your annual cycle will look like. So we see the cycle starts April 1st. So for this year, it'll be April 1, 2020, and then it ends March 31st of the next year. So that's where that cycle will lay. You have to have five authorized representatives, at least one on-campus faculty staff advisor, and you do have to register every year. So it's not a one and done thing. It's once you've registered, let's say April 5th of 2020, you're good until March 31st, and you hop right back on that cycle to re-register. So this is just a little bit policy related um, for your name and branding. So the biggest piece that we have to remind groups of um, is where UTSA falls if you choose to have UTSA as a part of your name. Um, it'll have to be in the beginning. So it's the Amanda Club at UTSA, not necessarily the University of Texas at San Antonio's Amanda Club. Um, and a lot of that is just based on where we want student organizations to fall, if they um, have more than one, or if a lot of people are utilizing the name, and then how much oversight the institution has for you. If you have specific questions about trademarks or identity guidelines, those can all be found online. And this is very important as you're designing shirts, and let's say you wanna use any particular logos, or you wanna use the UTSA block letters, you would have to get permission in order to use those. So part of this read registration cycle is having an up-to-date constitution. So all of these pieces have to be a part of your constitution before you're approved. Um, the ones that I'm going to highlight on will be the ones that are most likely missed in constitution um, checks. So the date of creation is a big one. Everybody puts when it was revised, but nobody puts when it was created. So make sure you have your date of creation. Um, your legal statement. So this one's very easy to pop in there. You can literally copy the organization agrees to abide by, let me move my chat, all university policies and local, state, and federal law. So if you just wanna copy and paste that in there, that will, um, that will be appropriate. And then the last two pieces are procedures for decision-making. So you have to include a quorum. What a quorum is, is basically how many members have to be present in order for your organization to vote. And then the last piece is a disbursement of organization assets. Um, this one will need to be very specific. So what we're looking to see is if your organization no longer exists at UTSA, what do we do with your monies or what do we do with your items? If you had, let's say, a bulletin board or you had a storage um, area, because if everybody leaves the roster, we're just left with a lot of stuff. And so you'd want to put in there um, the Amanda Club. Uh, should the Amanda Club cease to exist, all of our monies and assets will go to the National Amanda Foundation. Um, so if you're wanting things to go to your national headquarters or let's say a local um, service or philanthropy project, you'll need to put in there the local San Antonio Food Bank. Or um, if you say goodwill, then we'd like to know which goodwill you're talking about because maybe you have an affinity for the Days of Allah goodwill and you'd like for all of your assets to go there. So we need those to be as specific as possible. So what happens after you register and you've been approved? You'll need to attend state mandated risk management training annually. So this training as kind of stated in its title is uh, state required. So at any institution that receives state dollars, all of their organizations have to um, attend these trainings. So as of now, we hold them monthly and you can find probably starting in early August, all of the dates for those on Rowdy Link through the student activities page. Two members from every organization have to attend. Um, but the best part about that is you can represent up to two organizations. So if I'm a part of the Amanda Club and the Jordan Club, I can go in there and represent the Amanda Club and the Jordan Club. 
once you're done um, attending and you've had your two members attend, you'll then follow up and complete the compliance packet, which basically says that all the stuff you learned in state mandated risk management training, you're taking back to your organization and you're presenting it to them and they'll have to sign off on that. What we've been able to do during this time right now when organizations aren't meeting who needed to complete this towards the end of um, this last semester is they virtually gave these presentations and then members did electronic signatures. So as we kind of prepare for the fall and we're putting together a document on how to return to campus, we'll give best practices on how you can still be compliant with state policy. And then you'll also have to complete a disclosure of solicitation form. So this comes from our UT Board of Regents. So every University of Texas system schools organizations have to complete these complete this paperwork. Um, all this form is looking for is if you had any solicitation, so that's fundraisers or donations, money wise, you just need to report that out. So for instance, if let's say a alumni of your organization donated $200 in January, you would just report that on the form that you're filling out. But let's say this alumni said, I don't want to donate money, I would like to donate staplers for the organization to use. Because it's not money, it's more of a tangible item, you wouldn't need to report out that an alumni donated $200 worth of staplers to your organization. But any fundraisers you have, um, any donations, monetary, will need to be reported out in this uh, solicitation form from the previous semester. So you're always working a semester behind. So in the fall, you're gonna report out spring. Uh, next spring, you're gonna report out this fall. If you don't plan on hosting any more fundraisers or you don't plan on getting any more donations for this year, this form is actually up and ready to go on Student Activities Roddy link page. You can go ahead and start filling that out for your organization. If you choose not to fill this form out, um, your organization would then be um, out of compliance for continuing to be able to fundraise on campus. So you wouldn't necessarily go inactive um, or not be able to be an organization. We just wouldn't be able to allow you to participate in any fundraising opportunities on campus. I'll take a pause, make sure, because that was a lot of information in the last few slides. And then every March um, and sometimes April, depending on if we're in the middle of a pandemic, because this year these were definitely hosted in April. Um, but mostly every March, you will be able to attend Rowdy Sync workshops, which basically prepares you for the next year. Um, and it educates maybe your new officers, if you're an outgoing president, um, to understand everything that you knew about being president. So what forms you have to fill out, when are things due, what resources are available, so those are mandatory workshops every year um, in order to re-register. So for instance, if your group didn't go to Rowdy Sync in the spring, we would have considered you an inactive organization as in we don't foresee you coming back in the fall. If for some reason your group in the future, maybe currently missed out on Rowdy Sync, um, you're not gone forever. Um, if you ever miss out on Rowdy Sync or even state mandated and become um, inactive because of those two, you're able to reactivate your organization by going through the new organization startup process, which is attending just a new student organization meeting. Um, that's our level of accountability for groups, just to remind like, hey, here's everything that you have to do. We just want to make sure you understand so that way you don't become in compliant again. So here are our Rowdy Link statuses. So if you're an active organization, you've done state mandated, you've attended Rowdy Sync, you turned in your compliance packet, we consider you an active, good to go organization. You have five members, you have a faculty staff advisor. But let's say you're missing one of those two pieces, um, we then freeze you. So that way you can still complete all your requirements, but nobody can find you in Rowdy Link. Now let's say everybody in your organization left, you haven't been around for maybe a year or two, we go ahead and put all of those groups into an inactive status um, and everybody's membership if there's maybe like one person left in there but it's still in Rowdy Link so let's say all of the Amandas graduated from UTSA but in 10 years there's a there's 10 Amandas that show up and they want to restart the Amanda Club they will be able to utilize that Rowdy Link access portal. So part three 
let's talk a little bit about your own Rowdy Link page and notifications. So not only now in this virtual environment, but even the last three years, we've put more of an emphasis on utilizing Rowdy Link because the amount of student organizations have grown, the way people communicate is so different now that we offer a lot of online classes, that we wanna make sure that anytime we communicate, it doesn't always have to be in person. Um, so on this page, you'll be able to see the directions on how to turn on your Rowdy Link notifications. So that way, as we try to communicate and reach out to you, um, you're getting those from us. So you're gonna sign into your Rowdy Link and up on this right-hand corner, you're gonna see a picture of yourself or possibly your initial. From there, you'll click on that. You'll go to your notifications and it'll look like this area right here where it says event submissions. You'll have one which will always be checked by default is the system. But now if you also want these to go to your email, you're gonna to have to click over here to make sure you're getting these notifications to your email. Now the caveat to that is, um, a lot of Rowdy Link notif email notifications are going to junk or clutter. So you'll have to do one of two things. Either go to your email and set up a rule that says, I want all of these emails to go to my inbox, not my clutter slash junk. Or you just have to be pretty on top of always double checking your junk or clutter email to see if those notifications went there. I'll take a pause real quick for any questions. So let's talk a little bit about rosters. Rosters, we ask that they're updated at least once a year, even if that's just through your re-registration process. But anytime you have an officer change, we would like for you to update those. One is because the way that we communicate with our student groups is through Rowdy Link. And it's through what, what we do is we pull reports. So if I want to send out an email to all primary contacts, reminding them of a big due date that's coming up, I'll just log into Rowdy Link. I'll go into the administrative side of it and I'll say, I want to send a relay. I want it to go to only primary contacts and I want it to say this and then poof, it's sent. If your primary contact hasn't been updated in four or five years, even if they're on the roster, but they're not your primary contact and that's your president or somebody else you've designated to be in that position, they're never going to get this communication. So we ask that at least you do it once a year. If not, anytime things change in your organization. Also, this is how we keep track to make sure that if anybody's going to be utilizing materials or getting into your space, if you have workspaces or bulletin boards, that they're actually a part of your community. Um, so if they're on your roster, they have access to your mailbox, uh, event requests. Um, when they go to trainings, they can sign in on behalf of your organization. Um, and then as well as access to any of the supplies in the graphics room. So how to add people to your roster. So the first way is to go ahead and log into Rowdy Link, go to your memberships, um, and then you'll hit manage your organization. From there, it will take you um, to what we call the back end of your organization. You're gonna click on those little three pancake lines, and then it'll tell you all the things that you have access to um, as a member of the organization. So you'll click roster, and then you're gonna invite people using, again, their ABC123 email addresses and on separate lines. So you'll add them that way. I'm so sorry, let me go back, I apologize. Uh, so you'll add them that way and it'll send them an email if they've set it up in their notifications. If not, it'll default and send them a notification through Rowdy Link. Then they'll just go in there and they'll accept their membership to your organization. So let's talk about um, editing uh, officers in your Rowdy Link. So it'll be the same way. You're gonna find your organization, you're gonna go to the manage side of it, click on rosters again, and then let's say you wanna change uh, Michaela Bean. She's no longer your graduate advisor or she's no longer a member of the organization or an officer of the organization. So you'll click the little pencil and then you'll go down and you'll give her a new title or if this one was clicked, the authorized representative one, you'll just unclick that. Um, the best thing too about Rowdy Link is everything updates in real time. So if somebody quits at 9 p.m. and you go and you update their information at 9.05, if we send an email out at 8 a.m. the next day, it's gonna go to the most updated person. And then also in each pieces of your officer, you can give them various management 
um, access. So if you are a primary contact, you have full access to everybody on your, or you have full access to all the backend items for your organization, meaning you can edit the events on there, you can edit your roster, the gallery, forms, everything. Now, whenever you start getting into other officers or you're creating new positions in your Rowdy Link, you can say, you know what, our secretary maybe doesn't really need access to our photo gallery. We just want her to have access to documents so that way they're able to just upload minutes. So you can go in there and you can set those different access levels. And this is kind of what it looks like. Um, Everything by default, except for primary contact and some authorized user positions, are going to do all access. So you're just going to click limited access, and you're going to go through there and say yes or no to elections, documents, events, rosters, etc. So let's talk a little bit about cost centers. So cost centers are, are basically your on-campus bank accounts. Um, in order to set up a cost center, you'll need to obtain an EIN number uh, through the IRS. And so we have in our student organization handbook a step-by-step -step process on how to obtain your EIN number. And then also, once you get your EIN number, you will go to our student activities Roddy link page and we have a form that's called cost center setup. In order to participate in events like Fiesta, Best Fest, or even reserve space on campus, you will have to have a cost center in case there are any charges, if you, let's say, destroy space on campus, or if you raise a lot of money in Best Fest and we need to deposit money into your account, we'll do that through your cost center. It is not required at all to be an organization. Um, you just may not be able to do as much on campus as you would like if you don't have a cost center set up. Um, Unfortunately, cost centers cannot be linked to Venmo accounts or bank accounts. It's literally just your on-campus account. But another positive, though, is you don't have to have a specific amount in there. So if you, let's say, participate in Best Fest and you make $300 and you want to immediately take that out and put it into a different bank account that maybe your organization runs through Frost or a credit union, you can go ahead and do that. Your cost center just cannot go negative. So I'm gonna take a pause real quick and see if there are any questions about cost centers. Okay. I also think I just found where you can raise your hands and I think I found where I can see if you're raising your hand. So if you have a question, you can go ahead and raise your hands and I think I can allow you to talk in here. So we can try that out for this time too. And we kind of already talked about this, so it can't be linked to PayPal, Square, Cash App, et cetera. So let's talk a little bit about then events on campus and how that plays into your Rowdy Link pages. So again, in order to request events, you will have to have that person on your roster. So that's already one piece. To finalize events on campus, uh, you will have to finalize it through Rowdy Link as well. So the first step is um, submitting your event in Rowdy Link. I apologize. I have so many pieces open to make sure I can see if your hands are up and then also the chat. So it's kind of in the way of my actual presentation. So let me make these a little bit smaller. Um, so you'll go into Rowdy Link through your events page and you will submit all of your details and needs in Rowdy Link. And then let's say you're having, maybe not this year because this may, may not be the best year to do this, but let's say you're having a huge event and you are having off-campus vendors, it's 400 people, um, you may then need a planning uh, meeting right afterwards with the events management staff. So in order to create this event in Rowdy Link, remember you're going to go to the back end page, so that manage section. Um, you'll go to those three pancakes, click on that, and then click events. From there on the top right, you'll see create event. And this is kind of what your event pages will look like, is what exactly you're doing, um, when is it going to be, some of those basic questions. Now the big piece to consider is who do you want to show this to? 
So if this is a private meeting, let's say this is for your meeting space on campus, maybe you just want to show that to the members on or the members within your organization. So under event details, you would click show to and then it'll say members only. But now let's say that this is a recruitment event and you want to make sure that everybody knows that you're having a meeting and that you're going to have pizza there and you want people to come and check out your organization. You would still drop down to uh, faculty, staff, and students at the institution because remember you're not allowed to have off-campus guests as a part of your organization. And then um, if there's any perks or benefits, so if you're giving out free food or if there's giveaways, you can also denote that. So as people are filtering through your events, they can be like, oh, I want to go to this because there is a um, free food or there is a giveaway. Another piece in here is you can also have people RSVP. So if you are having um, food at your event and you want to make sure that you don't overbuy on pizzas or underbuy, you can put anybody can RSVP, just members can RSVP, and then you can also limit the amount of spots. So if the first 20 people are the ones who get pizza, you can do that as well in here. Okay, let me check and make sure there are no hands being raised. That's a really great question. So based on these new updates, I do not believe anymore that you're gonna have to fill out that 25 live form. It looks like everything now will go through RowdyLink. Um, I was gonna double check and see if Charlene was still in here, but she is not. Um, Campus Labs in this new virtual space has been made, making a lot of updates on what we can do at the institutions. So I will double check on that um, and make sure I give the answer to you at the end. In fact, okay, yeah, good question. In there, um, you can also put a cover photo. We always encourage people to make your cover photo super nice um, because if it's just that stock image, it doesn't get a lot of traction as you normally would. So a little bit about the event form in and of itself is the form on the back end is probably about 30 pages. However, unless you're planning one of these huge events, you'll never see that full form. You'll only see the pieces that you check yes to. So if this is just a basic meeting, you're literally doing nothing but showing up and talking. Um, you're going to click no throughout everything and then maybe you fill out four pages. But once you start hitting yes and saying, yes, we're going to have a fundraiser. Yes, we're going to have a donation we may have you fill out additional information. But this is still a lot easier than what our process used to be, um, which was we would have 25 forms all over campus and then you would be sent to different websites. So all of these forms have now been put into the um, reservation process on Rowdy Lee. And then this is kind of what the back end submission process looks like. So the bigger, I don't know why this keeps jumping ahead. So the bigger event, the more approvers that you'll have to have. So in here, it looks like this person um, is doing something on campus. There may be a safety issue because I see John Della Hunt's name is on there. Um, and basically all these people need to go in there. These are staff members on the institution side to say like, yes, this looks good. Yes, this looks good. And then ultimately Lydia Bueno as the, re as the reviewer will give you the thumbs up or the thumbs down. And then once she sees like everybody's weighed in, it looks like over here it was approved. Um, so we like to show this piece of it because it's not just events management or just student activities that is reviewing your events. It's a lot of other people based on where your event's happening or what the different yeses you said yes to are happening. There's also a discussion page. So if you feel like, man, I submitted this form two weeks ago, nobody said anything, you can chat with us and say, hey, it looks like it's been a few weeks. Is everything okay? Um, and then that keeps a record for you as well on how many times you're reaching out to us and it holds us accountable. But it also allows all of those other partners to see what's happening in the discussion. So that way they can say like, oh yeah, it looks like Amanda's already chatted with them. So everything's good, I can now give my review. So I'll take a beat real quick to see if um, there are any questions. Again, if you wanna raise your hand, it looks like I can allow you to talk or you can utilize the chat feature. And I'll give you about 30 seconds. Okay. Oh. 
Yes, uh, Shamir, so Octa Octavio just asked that question um, and I am reaching out to get an answer right now. Um, and I see they're typing back. So hopefully I'll have an answer within the next few slides. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about fundraising. Um, well, actually by a show of hands, and let's see if I can see when your hands are raised, raise your hand or do a reaction if you plan on fundraising in the fall. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, perfect. Um, so then we'll keep talking a little bit about fundraising. So these fundraising policies went into effect in 2016 um, based on how many times you can fundraise tax-free. So at UTSA, the way that we interpreted the policy, uh, because it's a 30-day policy, uh, is 30 days is about a month. So instead of doing 30 days out, we're just gonna say you can have one fundraiser um, every month on campus that's tax-free. Again, this will be pending um, if, how we're gonna come back to campus and what that campus looks like. But for your on-campus fundraising, you're allowed to fundraise once a month tax-free. The only two months where you're allowed to fundraise twice are the months in which Best Fest or Fiesta are held. Um, because technically Best Fest and Fiesta is a university fundraiser and then we're just distributing funds to you. And whenever you're filling out those event forms, they do have to be approved in Rowdy Link. So you would say, yes, I'm having a fundraiser. Um, and you'll have to make sure that you share those fundraisers um, on that solicitation form. And then before we go any further, I did get a response about 25 Live process and Rowdy Link. Okay, so I apologize. It does look like you still have to go through 25 Live first, and then you'll enter all those details into Rowdy Link, just like we've been doing for the last few years. And um, so Octavio and Shamir, do y'all mind doing a thumbs up just to make sure that you heard that? Perfect, thank y'all so much. Raffles, as a reminder, raffles are illegal in Texas. Uh, we strongly suggest that if you're doing something that may look like a raffle, that you call it a, um, a giveaway or a drawing. And then um, the award should be tangible awards, not necessarily money. And again, these are for on-campus events. Raffles are still illegal in Texas, but if you choose to do something off-campus, there's only so far our hands can reach. Um, but for sure, for anything on campus, can't use those words. So these are about postings on campus. So as I'm sure most of you are aware, but just in case, you can only post on the general posting boards or the approved location. So you can hang banners, for instance, um, over the JPL banner, um, but you still need to have approval before you can post anything on campus uh, through the Office of Student Activities. And in order to have your flyer approved, you'll have to have the name of your student organization on there, what exactly the event program or meeting is with the corresponding information. So you could do one flyer that talks about all of your meetings and say, the Amanda Club meets Wednesdays at 7 p.m. in the student union bear room. And then some type of contact information, whether that's a website address, an email, or a phone number. Things that we don't allow on campus are any type of commercial or promotional material. So if you're having a Chipotle fundraiser off campus, we wouldn't be able to allow that on there. Um, anything that will promote alcohol or illegal drugs, um, anything that's obscene, vulgar, uh, is there to incite uh, lawless action or off campus events. So let's say you're having a mixer at the block. Um, even though you're not fundraising at an off-campus location, because the location is off-campus, we wouldn't be able to um, approve that posting for on-campus use. So these are just fun examples over the years that we felt like really were eye-catching, were great flyers, met all of our um, guidelines. So we just like to use those because not everybody is creative like myself. All right, let's move on a little bit and talk about tabling. So for tabling, if again we come back in the fall and what that looks like, these are probably still gonna be a lot of the same policies. 
So you're not allowed to have amplified sound. And unfortunately, amplified sound means even if you're playing music off of your phone, it's still amplified. Um, you can have things like pop-up tents, letters, small lawn games. Uh, but whenever you're filling out that Rowdy Link event form, you'll just let us know like, hey, we plan on having a tent out there and some cornhole. So that way we can make sure that if 75 people are having that same thing, do we need to create different walkways on campus? Um, or do we need to limit the tabling on that day? You do have to identify which organization you're a part of that's out there tabling. And then only members of the organization can staff the table. Um, meaning while we allow anybody to come on campus now because we're an open public forum campus, behind your actual table should only be student organization members. What you do on the sides of the tables or maybe what happens 10 feet away, that's still up to that individual that's on campus that's not a part of your organization but they just may be talking to people. There are certain date restrictions so we don't allow tabling during Best Fest, uh, Dia en la Sombria, formerly known as Fiesta, involvement fair, study days, finals, or summer new student, new student orientations. So this was a question that was asked earlier in the chat, but what exactly does the institution help us out with? So here are some of the resources that we do have available. Again, we'll be figuring out how we can do these in a virtual space. Um, but we do have our complex space, which historically has been used to have quick meetings or to come in and hang out or have office hours. Uh, you, depending on when you register, we do have about 150 bulletin boards on campus that you can promote your organization. We have a graphics room for uh, creating posters on campus. We have a leadership library. So we have books that you can check out that talks about how to lead your organization tablecloths, tents, we have supplies, we have craft supplies, so markers, tape, glue, staplers, etc. We also recently this last year invested in more team building resources. Um, we got a lot of feedback that groups wanted like icebreakers, um, they wanted ways to get their organizations to interact with each other, so we invested um, into team building resources. Uh, also, if you, for any reason, lose your advisor, we do have a database of advisors that we can help you out with. Um, and then also, this isn't necessarily through our office, but with Student Government Association, there is the opportunity to uh, request funding through Leader Fund. And again, just as another small plug, for anybody to have access to any of these supplies, they do need to be on your roster. So just remember, again, to always update your roster. So for bulletin boards and workspaces or storage spaces, these still are assigned per academic year through your re-registration. If you're not actively utilizing it or updating it, we will um, ultimately take it away. We are trying to figure out how this will be done in a virtual space, depending on what the institution says fall will look like in terms of coming onto campus. So we hope that we can still offer these. Um, and if you have any suggestions on how we can do this virtually, please email getinvolved at utsa.edu. Um, we're still looking at ways that we can help organizations um, continue to thrive. Um, are there any questions as it relates to bulletin boards or workspaces? I'll look to see if there are any hands that are raised or any questions in the chat. Okay. Mailboxes. So UTSA does allow you to have your student organization mail sent directly to us and then we file it away into a folder. That way if you don't want it to send to your specific address or maybe you just want a common place so as you change presidents and contact information you don't really have to update mailing addresses. We just ask that you check it once a week. Um, if you have any mail there that's not picked up including large packages after um, a full week we'll email you just to let you know like hey Looks like you forgot. Ultimately, we'll have to RTS it and return it back to the sender if you don't pick it up. So the graphics room. Um, basically, our graphics room is an arts and crafts room. We have helium, butcher paper, scissors, paints. You can only use it right now for two hours a day. Some of these may change as we look to return in the fall and how we will ensure cleaning happens while groups are utilizing the space. You'll have to be on the roster in order to check out this space. 
And then you just can't take anything out of the space. Um, so if you're gonna paint a large banner, it has to be done in our graphics room, not necessarily in the hallway. The graphics room is located in the HEB Student Union, um, right there as you walk through Subway towards the left-hand side. So here are some of the supplies that we offer. I'm gonna see if this video works, but in case you missed my, um, my note in the beginning, me and technology do not work well together, so we'll see if this works. My name's Alan and I am the front desk Somebody student assistant here at Student Activities. We just wanted to go ahead and show you some of the resources that we have Perfect. for you here at Student Activities for registered student organizations. We have different things like a variety of tapes, staplers, and scissors. Over here, if you're trying to transport some bulky items, we have a foldable wagon and a foldable dolly right over here. And if you have a bulk load of paper to cut, we have this huge paper cutter here at Student Activities as well. If you need assistance, just let any of the front desk members know. To check out any of these resources, we will need your student ID and to verify that you are on the roster for any of your registered student organizations on Rowdy Link. Stop on by for student activities, resources, and have a great day. Perfect. Um, so that's a little bit about what we offer. We're always looking for ways we can build out more of the supply. So the last two years, um, we've really been investing. So again, last year, our focus was on tea building because we got a lot of inquiry back that these are things that groups would like to have. So if there's something that you're like, my group and tons of other groups use this all the time, can you please provide something we can check out. That's why we bought tents last year. Um, that's why we bought tablecloths also last year. So that way you're not having to spend your own money to be able to do programming on campus. We can try to help you out as best we can, um, as well as other organizations that also may wanna utilize these resources. So another group outside of student activities that you have um, to really advocate for you to share feedback is the Council of Student Organizations. We jokingly like to call them the SGA for student org. So if you have something that you love and you want people to keep doing, these are a council of your peers um, to really advocate for you to plan activities that meet your needs um, or to review policies and guidelines if you feel as though something needs to be added to our handbook or why is something there. Um, follow them on social media, interact with them. Also applications to be a part of their group are currently open on Roddy Link. So if this is something that you would like to be a part of, visit their Rowdy Link page and they'll have their officer applications there. This is the Office of Student Activities information. Um, so again, if, <clears throat> I'm so sorry, if you have questions about um, events on campus, Rowdy Link, your specific student organization and maybe you're frozen or you need a check-in on updating your roster. This is a way to get a hold of us so that a way we can interact and um, help you out. 